and we broadcast. Hi, welcome back to Grockets OGTV. This is the GMAT edition where we go through the questions in the official guide, question by question, um, problem by problem, page by page, and uh, whoa, I totally did not want to do that. Um, page by page, problem by problem, uh, using the 12th edition of the guide. That's this one right here. My name is Jim Jacobson, and I will be your tutor this evening or morning, depending on what time it is for you right now. And without further ado, let's get started. Last time we left off with question number 77 on page 163. So page 163, question 77. Has some answer choices, as do they all. Uh, three, four, six, seven, eight. Three, four, six, seven, eight. So there are four more women than men on Centerville's Board of Education. If there are ten members on the board, how many are women? So we know that the women plus the men equals ten, ten members on the board, and there are ten more women than there are men. So if W equals the women, which remember is the variable that we're solving for, um, and there are four more women, then if we subtract four from the number of women, we get the number of men. We could have done this the other way around where we, you know, because they expressed in the problem the idea that there were four more women, we could have made M the men and made M plus four the women. But since W is the variable that the question is actually solving for, when possible, you can set up these problems so that you will solve for the, for the thing you're interested in automatically with just a little adjustment in your thinking by going to W minus four instead of M plus four. Anyway, we now have, um, well, we have a way of substituting in this value here, the value for men, into the value for m in our original equation. So we get w plus, so that's the women, plus w minus 4, that's the men, equals 10. So then that's 2w minus 4 equals 10, um, 2w equals 14, and w equals 7, which of course was what the question is asking, is how many women are on their board of education? Answer choice, D. Note that if we had initially solved for uh, men, which is the way the problem is set up a little bit for us to do, we would have come up with answer choice A, which is our trap answer there. If we did not then convert from M to M plus four to get the women, you know, to get the seven, we would have chosen A and we would have been sad. So anyway, that's it for question number 77. On to number 78, still on page 163. So, our choices are $10,464, eight hundred sixty-four dollars $816, a flat $800, and then $480. So Leona bought a one-year $10,000 certificate of deposit that paid interest at an annual rate of 8% compounded semi-annually. What was the total amount of interest paid on this certificate at maturity? Important formula for the GMAT, and you really do just have to commit this one to memory if you haven't already, is that um, the, the amount of interest is equal to the amount of principal, P, um, and this is uh, for compounded interest. Where um, A equals or well, not the interest, but the, the new amount.
P is the principal that you start off with. So R is the annual interest rate. And then N is the number of times uh, that the interest is compounded annually. So we are given all this information in our actual problem, except for A, <laughs> which is what we're solving for. Um, so we know that her principal was a $10,000 CD. Put the comma in there to make it clear. Um, times one, the one stays the same. The rate is the annual interest rate, which was 8%. Come on, there we go. And the number of times that interest is compounded annually. So if something is compounded semi-annually, it is compounded every half year. So it is compounded twice per year. And then um, that number again appears here. And then the time, it was only over the course of a one-year CD. So n is 2 and t is 1. So we can simplify this a little bit. Um, A equals still that 10,000. Uh, 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 2 is simply 0 0.04. And then that's going to be squared. Um, A equals still 10,000. 1.04 1 quantity squared. Um, and uh, you know, if you square 1.04, you get so it'd be 10,000 times um, 1.0816. So you would just multiply one if you can't do it in your head. Be 1.04 times 1.04, and you'd multiply them together. Blah 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 blah, um, and you get one. Six, um, and from that already, just looking at ten thousand times one point oh eight one six, we would just move the decimal point over. Um, so one, two, three, four, five places, um, or four places, excuse me, four zeros, um, and we get ten thousand eight hundred sixteen dollars. That's why she started off with ten thousand, which gives us the eight hundred sixteen dollar amount of interest accumulated. Choice C. Note that uh, uh, answer choice A um, includes the original $10,000 in there. So that one is assuming that someone has calculated the, or calculated, solved the question for the wrong, uh, solved the wrong question for this problem. Anyway, okay, moving on to the next one which is number 79 on 163. So we have 840.0, 0, 84.0, 8.4, Zero point eight four. I detect a trend in our answer choices. Zero point zero eight four. So it seems pretty clear that no matter what, we're actually <laughs> that that the answer uh, that the question is assuming we're going to be able to figure out that um, something is going to equal eighty four, um, which is comforting um, because in theory, anyway, we wouldn't even have to do the math on this one. Uh, we would just need to figure out basically what power of 10, because all of these are just different powers of 10. So, you know, this is 84, you know, times 10 to the second. This is 84 times 10 to the first. Um, or, sorry, um, this is 84 times 10 to the first. This is 84 times 10 to the zero. You know, 84 times 10 to the, anyway, you get the idea. 
Um, they're all different powers of 10. So let's take a look at this problem. So we have um, 0 0.00, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, that's a 3. Ugh. There isn't an easy way for me to erase what this particular, I'm just going to rewrite it. 0 0.0036 times 2.8 over 0 0.04 times 0 0.1 and times 0 0.003. So that's a lot of decimal places, and it's now becoming clear why they, all the different answer choices are different powers of 10. Um, <clears throat> one way to make this easier is one of the reasons why scientific notation was developed is basically to get rid of all these decimal points and get all of these things with a common base um, with different fractions. So let's get all of them converted to whole numbers, no more decimals, as powers of 10. So the first one is 36 times 10 to the negative 4. First one, the second one is 28 times 10 to the negative 1. I only had to move the decimal point 1 on that one. Times 4 times 10 to the negative 2. And this is uh, just 1 times 10 to the negative 1. And then lastly, 3 times 10 to the negative 3. Also 3. Um, so some things to remember about exponents. Remember when we have uh, x to the a times x to the b, that equals x to the a, a plus b. If we have x to the a over x to the b, when we're dividing by exponents, um, that equals x to the a minus b. Um, that's a minus. OK. So and we'll be applying these rules. Uh, so now we have all these different uh, 10 to the 10 to the x to the negative exponents, basically. Um, and then we also have these other numbers, which we can kind of separate out. So. Uh, all of these are multiplied across each other, so 36 times 10 to the negative fourth times 28 times 10 to the first and 10 to the negative first. We can kind of reconfigure how these are ordered. So this is the same thing as 36 times 28 times 10 to the negative four times 10 to the negative one. And do the same thing over here. We have four times one times 3, and then we have the exponents, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 1, and 10 to the negative 3. And that makes our life a little bit easier. Um, so remember then, uh, when you multiply exponents together, like we have here, we add them together. So that whole top section of 10s, we get 36 times 28 um, times 10 to the negative 5 because negative 4 plus negative 1 is negative 5. We do the same thing with the bottom. We can ditch the uh, the uh, the 1, you know, 4 times 1 times 3. In fact, let's just say it's 4 times 3 is 12. Save ourselves a little bit of work. Negative 2 plus negative 1 plus negative 3 is negative 6. Okay, now we're going to be using the other rule that we figured out when we have 10 to the a over, or x to the a over x to the b. We have x, or 10 to the negative 5 over um, 10 to the negative 6. We would subtract the two from each other. Um, we can also do a little simplification. Note that 36 over 12, 12 is just, uh, 3 times 12 is 36, so this is the same thing as replacing this with a 3 and this with a 1, which makes our life easier. Um, yeah. 
So um, then we are left with just the, wait, I did something wrong here. What did I do wrong? Anyway, let's deal with the exponents. Um, we'll leave them as, as they were. Um, so when we subtract them, this would actually be the negative five um, times negative six, or not times, uh, negative five minus negative six, because when we divide exponents by each other, I'm gonna rewrite that out, negative five minus negative six is the same thing as negative five plus six. So whatever it is, this is going to equal something times 10 to the first. Um, oh no, I did this right. I don't know what I was, anyway. So that simplified, the numerator simplified to three times 28 times 10 to the first power. Three times 28 ends up equaling 84, like we couldn't have guessed that. 84 times 10 to the first is the same thing as 840 which is answer choice A. My moment of confusion was because when I uh, canceled out the, uh, the 36 and the 12, you know, and rewrote the three up here and the one down here, I sort of just ignored that I'd just written the three and I thought, hey, this doesn't come out to be 28 times 10 to the first. I just totally ignored the three I had just written. So no, that was 100% right. We can simplify this part of the fraction here. Three times 28, 84 times 10 to the first. So uh, comfort with scientific notation is very important. Apparently comfort with simplifying fractions is also important because I just got myself confused and second guessed myself in my own problem on my own broadcast. So yeah, that's, I guess the lesson here, the takeaway is that this can happen to anybody. Um, if you second guess yourself, just go back through your work and make sure you're doing it right. Onward. So question number 80. Oops, 163, question 80, 22, 25, 28, 32, and 56. So machine A produces bolts at a uniform rate of 120 every 40 seconds and machine B produces bolts at a uniform rate of 100 every 20 seconds. If the two machines run simultaneously, how many seconds will it take for them to produce a total of 200 bolts? So, machine A produces rates at, oh, produces bolts at a rate of 120 every 40 seconds. Machine B produces bolts at a rate of uh, 100 every 20. Okay, so we can simplify each of these fractions. 120 to 40 is the same thing as a rate of three to one. 100 over 20 is the same as the rate of five to one. So machine A produces three bolts every, every second. Uh, machine B produces five bolts every second. The two of them working together then produce eight bolts every second. How many seconds will it take for them to produce 200 bolts? We just divide 200 bolts divided by eight bolts per second. 200 divided by eight equals 25. Because 100, well, 100 divided by four is 25. So Dividing 200 by 8, doubling that numerator and denominator gives us the same number, 25. Or you could do the math, the, uh, you could do the long division and it still comes out, or reduce the fraction and it still comes out. However you simplify from uh, 200 eighths to 25, you will still arrive at answer choice B, 25 seconds to produce 200 volts. Okay, uh, number 81. Okay, 12.0, 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, 12.4, 12.5, 12.6, 12.7, 12.8, 12.9, 12.10, 12.11, 12.12, 12.13, 12.14, 12.15, 12.16, 12.17, 12.18, 
12.4. So data for a certain biology experiment are given in the table above. If the amount of bacteria present increased by the same factor during each of the two three-hour periods shown, how many grams of bacteria were present at 4 o'clock p.m.? So I guess I probably should reproduce elements of this. So the first one, we're at 10 grams. Then the second time, we're at x grams. And then finally, we end up at 14.4 uh, 14 grams. Um, you may have noticed, I don't know if this is something you've come across before, but uh, data here is listed as a plural noun. Uh, data are given. Technically, that's correct. It's a Latin plural noun. The singular is datum, only one given thing. Uh, nobody, almost nobody uses the singular anymore, but, um, and increasingly data as a noun is used as a singular, but technically it is a plural. Good story. I realize this isn't the verbal side, but just in case you were wondering about that. So, the issue that we have here, uh, clearly from our answer choices, there's going to be a very little distinction between these, which means we'll have to do some precise calculation. This isn't one where we would be able to figure out the correct answer just by solving for the first digit. What we know is that uh, going from 10 grams to X and from X grams to 14.4 grams happened uh, at the same rate because it says um, they increased by the same factor. So let's just call that factor, um, let's just call it y since we already have x. So um, 10, our initial starting grams, so y equals a factor, the mysterious constant factor that the, the bacteria increase. So 10 times that factor of y gives us x grams. And in turn, that same factor, x times y, gets us 14.4 grams in the end. Now, since we actually, so uh, let's just write those as actual equations. The first equation is that initial 10 grams times our growth factor of y gave us a, a value of x. And we also know that x times y, that x grams times our y growth factor, gave us 14.4. But here, right here in this first equation, we have a value we can substitute into the second equation. If we know that x equals 10y, then we know then we can say um, 10y times y using our second equation equals 14.4, which is pretty cool. 10y squared equals 14.4. Let's divide both sides by 10. Um, y squared equals 1.44. And um, with this one, it really helps to know. Um, it is very, very helpful to know the, the, the squares of numbers. I would say ideally through 15. Um, it really helps to know that 12 squared equals 144, because then it's very much uh, clearer that uh, y was 1.2. Um, so of course the question was not uh, was not what the factor is, but we need to know how many grams were actually present at uh, at point x. So really we were solving for x, and in theory I could have substituted I could have taken this equation, divided both sides by 10, and have a substitute value for y. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, I just chose to do that because I would rather deal with uh, numbers rather than fractions because we have to undo the fractions anyway. So we just need to multiply 10 times that growth factor that is no longer mysterious of 1.2. 10 times 1.2 gives us 12. I guess we just moved the decimal point over. Which is answer choice A. If you didn't realize that um, uh, that uh, that uh, 144 was 12 squared, uh, you probably would have had to take out. Um, well, in this case, you would you could have taken out three. You would have had to taken out uh, some perfect squares like nine and four uh, from 
the answer choice. You know, gradually take out things that you know are perfect squares, divide those out, and eventually you would have come out to 1.2. But it, it is much easier just to know that 12 squared equals 144. Okay, that's it for 81. 82. And 63. Number 82. Complicated answer choices. n times n plus 1 times n minus 4 n times n plus 2 times n minus 1. n minus 5. Four and minus two and n plus five and minus six. Okay, if n is an integer greater than six, which of the following must be divisible by three? Wow, right, so this is an interesting question. Um, which of the following must be divisible by three? Which means, what, what it's asking for, is which of the following, no matter what number you pick, greater than six, per the instructions of the question, no matter what number you pick, the whole thing needs to be divisible by three. Um, of course, if we choose a value for n that is itself divisible by three, like nine, something like nine, um, that takes care, that's what this first, so, so really uh, each, each of these has three parts. We have x times y times z. We have three different parts. x here is n. If n itself is, divis is, is a number divisible by three, the whole expression is going to be divisible by three. So um, basically what this, what this is doing for us with three different parts in each of the answer choices, it's accounting for three different types of digits. Um, so for example, we'll, let's write out, uh, so we have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's probably enough. Anyway, we aren't worried about six because we're starting there. But, so these are the numbers divisible by three. Every third number is divisible by three. That's pretty much the definition of divisible by three. So every third number is divisible by three. By having three parts in each of the answer choices, this accounts for the three different types of digits. You can have um, the number itself divisible by three. That's the n value. That's these guys. Um, and then the other two values need to account for the other two types of numbers from any sequence of numbers here. Um, the other two answer choices, numbers two and three, are accounting for the other ones in this mess. So we have numbers that are one more than a multiple of three and numbers that are one less than a multiple of three. So the question is really asking us, which of these answer choices do parts two and three, do y and z, the second two things in each of these answer choices, which of these reliably give us a number, you know, one more or one less than a multiple of three, because n itself gives us a multiple of three. So really, there's, a, there's nothing for it other than just looking at the answer choices. Um, we just need to make sure they, they cover both in each expression. So let's look at choice A first. n plus one, so if n is the multiple of three, n plus one gives us the one that's one more. And n minus four, maybe I should have chosen 12. Uh, well, it works for every one of them. n plus one gives us the one that's one more. n minus four um, gives us one, two, three, four gives us the number that's one less than the multiple of three. Now keep in mind, it doesn't need to be the same number one more and one less. When we start off with um, 
you know, just with n as the multiple of 3. It doesn't have to equal n plus 1 and n minus 1. We just need to cover every possible. And that's why they're starting with numbers greater than 6. Basically, uh, by starting with 6, we never end up further back than 3. Um, because 7 minus 4 gets us at 3. If, we ne if our lowest possible number for n is 7, we never go below the lowest possible multiple of 3, which is 3. Long explanation. What I'm saying here, then, is that this particular answer choice, answer choice A, covers every number one, it covers every number that's a multiple of three, every number that's one more than a multiple of three, and every number that is one less than a multiple of three for, multiple, for, for values of n greater than six. So choice A is actually the correct answer. The other way that you could test this one is just to choose two different numbers we already knew that um, if you chose a multiple of 3, n times anything would give you another multiple of 3. Um, so we basically needed to test uh, two different numbers, these ones that are between the multiples of 3. I would have chosen 7 and 8. Test each of those in each of the answer choices to make sure that um, it stays a multiple of 3. So we would have tested 7 and tested 8. Just plug in 7 and 8 for um, each of the answer choices and the answer choice would need to stay a multiple of 3. So we would have done 7 minus 4 is, so it would have been 7 times 8 times 3. Um, multiply all that out. Um, it does end up being a multiple of 3. Same thing with 8. We would have done the same thing. Answer choice A would have been correct. So you can either do it by picking numbers or by kind of mathematical reasoning. We just needed numbers um, we need to account for all the different numbers that um, could be multiples of 3 to make it all uh, a multiple of 3. Just in case that wasn't clear, I kind of want to just say this one more time. We are assuming that if we choose, when I was doing this stuff going back 4, we were assuming that we were choosing a number that was not a multiple of 3, because if we chose a multiple of 3, it would be n. But let's just use that sequence, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Let's choose a number like 13. Um, n plus 1 does not get us to a multiple of 3. n minus 4 does get us to a multiple of 3. If we had chosen um, 11 as our number, n minus 4 does not get us a multiple of 3, but n plus 1 does. So this is set up so that no matter what number we pick, one of these three things makes the whole thing a multiple of three. Okay, that's enough for this question. I've had enough of question number 82, and I have a feeling you have too. Last one on page 375, 450, five dollars, and last but not least, that's a 550. So the total cost for company X to produce a batch of tools is ten thousand dollars plus three dollars per tool. Each tool sells for eight dollars. The gross profit earned from producing and selling these tools is the total income from sales minus the total production cost. If, the, if a batch of 20,000 tools is produced and sold, then company X's gross profit per tool is. So we're given some useful information. We're given several equations. One is that um, income, total income minus production cost divided by the number of units produced equals the um, profit per tool. Okay. We also know that their cost to produce 
starts off at $10,000, probably some kind of setup fee, plus $3 per tool. We know that they're producing 20,000, so let's figure out that cost. Ten thousand plus three plus uh, three dollars per tool at, at twenty thousand tools equals what's the total of seventy thousand dollars because three times two is six plus ten or plus one seventy thousand so the cost is seventy thousand the income um, remember it's twenty thousand tools times eight dollars per tool. Income is going to be one hundred sixteen thousand dollars. No, one hundred sixty. I was right the first time. One hundred sixty thousand. Let's rewrite that out. Okay, so their profit per tool then is that income, that one hundred sixty thousand dollars minus. The seventy thousand dollar set uh, production cost divided by the number of units produced. One hundred sixty thousand minus seventy thousand equals ninety thousand. Dividing that by twenty thousand, we cancel out all those zeros. Nine halves. Um, nine halves is the same thing as four and a half, which in dollar terms is four dollars and fifty cents. Choice C. Okay. Turning the page to number eighty four on one sixty four. Let's see, three Q over two hundred. Three Q over two. One hundred fifty Q. Q over one hundred plus fifty, and one fifty over Q. So a dealer originally bought one hundred identical batteries at a total cost of Q dollars. If each battery was sold at 50% above the original cost per battery, then in terms of Q, for how many dollars was each battery sold? So uh, if this uh, dealer bought um, 100 batteries at uh, Q dollars, um, then one battery, we would just divide the whole thing by, by 100, one battery will be um, one one hundredth of the, that Q dollars, right? So 100 batteries at Q dollars, one one hundredth of that is the price of one battery. So um, one battery is one one hundredth Q. Um, we need to figure out though what this was when sold at a 50% profit. So 50% profit means that it was sold for 150% um, of the original price. So no profit, um, it would be 100% of Q. No profit equals just one over 100 times Q. A 50% profit would be um, 1.5 times 1 one hundredth of Q. Converting it in terms of fractions, 1.5 is the same thing as 3 halves. Three, so 50% profit is 3 halves times 1 over 100 times Q, which is really Q over 1. It's a Q, trust me. Um, so we can just multiply across. 3 times 1 times Q equals 3Q. 2 times 100 times 1 is 200. 3Q over 200 is the price or the profit or the sale price 
at a 50% profit for these batteries that this dealer is selling and buying? Choice A is the correct answer. Um, you can see some similarities with some of the incorrect answers. This one is just kind of assuming that we um, didn't actually divide by 100. Um, I'm not sure where some of these other ones get. I think the, the 50 is coming from the idea of a 50%, that it'd be a 50% cost, and, or that this one's 150% of just the value of Q, which is the price of 100 batteries. This is 100 batteries rather than uh, just the one. Anyway, moving on. Now we're number 85. 564 585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-585-
we find out machine B's rate right from the problem, 100 parts in 40 minutes. parts every 40 minutes. We find out from the problem that uh, machine B produces parts, produces 100 parts twice as fast as machine B does. So it produces 100 parts in half the time. It could have also just been, you know, 200 parts in 40 minutes, but it's 100 parts in 20 minutes. It amounts to the same thing. But the problem, strictly speaking, does say that it produces 100 parts twice as fast. We have no reason not to mess with it. In general, 100 is actually a very easy number to work with, so um, we'll leave it as it is. We're trying to figure out how many parts machine A produces in 6 minutes, so we first need to figure out its parts per minute. 100 over 20 is the same thing as 5 parts every minute, which is great. 5 parts every minute, how many is that? In six minutes, six times five equals 30 parts in six minutes. 30 is what we were after there, which is answer choice A. Straightforward. Okay, number 87. So 16, 32, 41, 54, and 68. A necklace is made by stringing n individual beads together in the repeating pattern red bead, green bead, white bead, blue bead, and yellow bead. If the necklace design begins with a red bead and ends with a white bead, then n could equal what? Let's get that down. So it, the sequence is a repeating pattern of red bead, green bead, white bead, blue bead, and yellow bead. It's very kind of them to choose colors that all have different first letters. Um, would have been tricky otherwise. So it's a repeating pattern of five beads. Every five beads Every sixth bead, the, the pattern repeats itself. So if the necklace begins with the red bead and ends with a white bead, then the number, the number of beads, n individual beads together in a pattern, the number could equal what? So one thing to notice, of course, is that since it doesn't end on y, um, it's not, whatever it is, it can't be a multiple of five. I, I haven't gone to the answer choices yet, but we know it, it, it's not going to be a multiple of five. In fact, what we do know is that it's going to be a multiple of, it's either going to be three beads long, which from the answer choice, you know, so one, two, three, it's either going to be three beads long, which is not possible from the answer choices, or it's going to be a multiple of five. We go from red, green, white, blue, yellow. We go through that some number of times, and then we have, and so that's going to be a multiple of five and then it's going to have three more tacked on. So in a sense, the answer choice is going to be um, divisible by five with a remainder of three. The three being the red, green, and white beads that are left short of the next, uh, the next multiple of five up. So, 16 divided by 5 is 3, remainder 1, um, because, you know, 16 times, or 15 times, 5 times 3 is 15, plus 1 gets us 16. 32 divided by 5 is 6, remainder 2. Um, 41 divided by 5 um, is 8, remainder 1. 54 divided by 5, that's 1 short, um, that gives us 10, remainder 4. 68, um, of course, just by process of elimination, we know that this one must be right. Um, but uh, 15 times uh, 
5 is 65. No, it's 75. 13, <laughs> 13 times 5 uh, is 65. So um, for this one, 65 uh, subtracted from 68 gives us a remainder of 3. So um, this one is the only one that gives us the remainder of 3 that we were after to account for the 3 beads that were left after we went through the sequence, in this case, 13 times. Choice E, 68, is the correct answer. Okay, let's, uh, let's do one more. Or maybe more than one more, it depends on how long this one takes. Um, 164, number 88. Okay, nine, three, seven thirds, one, and one third. In the xy coordinate system, if the point A, B, and the point A plus three, B plus K are two points on the line defined by the equation x equals three y minus seven, then K equals what? Um, so we have this one equation, x equals, that's an x, 3y minus 7. And we have two points, a, b, and k plus 3, b plus k. And of course, uh, when you get equations of lines, it is always tempting to consider whether you should put it in slope-intercept form. In this particular case, simply, sim since we are simply solving for the variable k, um, it's not necessary, um, but that is a good instinct to have. So we, we can actually substitute, so in each of these cases, right, this is the x value and this is the y value, this is the x value and this is the y value, we can substitute our a's and our b's, or our a plus 3's and our b plus k's, into the equation that we have. So we know then that a, which is our x value, equals 3b minus 7. Just substituting a for, a, or, yeah, a for x and b for y. We can do the same thing over here on the other side with our other pair of coordinate points, a plus 3 um, equals three times the quantity b plus k um, minus seven. So it stays the same on both sides. Um, we also know uh, then what the value for a is. We know that a is three b minus seven, so we can actually just substitute this in for our a right here, and then we're only left with two variables. We're left with b and k. Um, so then we have, so 3b minus 7 plus 3 equals, and I'm going to go ahead and multiply this out, 3b plus 3k minus 7. So 3b um, minus 4, this uh, 3b minus 7 plus 3, uh, gives us 3b minus 4 equals 3b plus 3k minus 7. You may notice that we can actually subtract out the uh, 3b expressions here. Um, so uh, we will do so, cross these out. We get 3k minus 7 equals negative 4. Um, we can add 7 to both sides, 3k equals 3, so k equals 1. Answer choice D, the simplest looking one. So again, we didn't have to put this in slope-intercept form. It wouldn't have messed things up if we had. We could have, you know, again, the slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. Um, it, it would have still worked, um, but there was just no reason to do so, and it might have made the calculations more difficult because uh, we would have had to divide both sides by 3 at some point, so we would have had 1 third x plus 7 thirds 
y equals one third x plus seven thirds. I just did that in my head. That might not be right, but it's something like that. Um, and you know, it's easier to deal with multiples of three than it is with multiples of one third. It just is. It is for me anyway. So that's why I did it this way. Uh, but it wouldn't. Have, you would have still been able to solve the quest, uh, solve the problem, had you converted it into slope-intercept form. So it's really just a simple substitution question. Anyway, um, that constitutes the end of this particular lesson. We always have to make sure these are done within an hour to make sure we have room for the next programming uh, slot, um, if any. Um, you've been watching Grocket OGTV, the GMAT edition, where we go through the 12th edition of the, of the Guide to the Test. That's them over there. My name is Jim Jacobson. I've been your tutor today. And uh, next time, we will pick up with question... I already lost track of where we are. Question number 89 on page 164. So, um, we'll see you then.